welcome to the Counterattack playthrough series. We're continuing with our playthrough series of Operation Dauntless. This is scenario number one, the very first real scenario that is, you know, basically a non-tutorial scenario that I've played, so I'm looking forward to this. Uh, I've done a bunch of playthroughs of uh, the scenarios, um, so go check them out if you haven't seen them, but uh, I chose to skip the sort of the last two or three. Um, I read through them, I'm like, yeah, I, I got this, and this looks way more fun. So uh, this is called Nightmarish Crossroads, the Battle for Cristo. Cristo is a town over here. Uh, by the way, my map is upside down and sort of folded partially so I can fit it here. Um, so sorry about that. But uh, yeah, Cristo is these six village hexes over here. They're held by the Germans. If the British uh, are able to capture them um, and hold them at the beginning of their reset phase, they instantly win. So uh, the Germans want to hold on to Cristo, prevent that. Um, additionally, the Germans can instantly win if they destroy two British companies from the same battalion. These companies are all in the same battalion, this mint green battalion. I believe there's a reinforcement that's another battalion. So if either of those battalions lose two full companies, the Germans instantly win. Otherwise, it's going to be a six turn slugfest with the victor being whoever has the most victory points. The German losses, if I recall correctly, count as double victory points. Let me talk about uh, the choices I made in where I placed units, and then we'll get playing. So the British, they had to set up within two hexes of this location. They had to set up before the Germans. So uh, I kind of knew where the Germans were going to be positioned, right? So I, I set up a, a few mixed uh, unit stacks here. that will be sort of the assault stacks. So they have infantry and armor mixed in. This location here is on a hill. You can see uh, a good amount of stuff here into some of this close terrain, across these fields, of course. So I put some anti-tank guns and machine guns there. They'll move up later, but that will be a good sort of um, harassing or even bombarding um, fire location. Uh, but otherwise, there's not much to the British setup. The German setup, though, uh, took me a long time to do this. So um, when I saw the British setup, um, I chose to not put any forces down here. Um, one of these hexes down here is, I have to set up within three hexes of it. Uh, I forget which one. And then I think this hex I had to set up within three hexes of as well. So, um, yeah, so I could have come out to here, but I chose to keep it back. And what I did instead was I chose to like create like, a um, two strong positions. I have three strong points, but two strong positions and then sort of a weak looking position area in between to try to draw the British into it. Uh, sort of into, yeah, try, try to draw them in so I can then get them in the flanks basically. So uh, I set up first this um, strong point down here. It's in these woods um, that are a hill that looks down over here. So that's actually a good spot for the allies to get because they can see all through here. Um, so yeah, it's a strong point anti-tank gun, machine gun, and two infantry companies. Hopefully they can hold that off for a while. Um, they're backed by some some reinforcements nearby, and there's even a fallback strong point back there. But uh, yeah, so I want to, um, that's one of my main strong points that I want to try to hold on to. I put another one down here on this hill. The designer even advised this through some anti-tank uh, anti gun unit, infantry gun, infantry company, and machine gun there with a strong point. That's also on a hill and can see you know a decent amount over here. And the idea is uh, I left this looking pretty weak in here and hopefully that, hoping the allies might come in here. Of course, I'm playing myself. But I'm going to do my best to make decisions as if I don't know what I am planning, if that makes any sense. So uh, I am using a lot of optional rules, not all of them, but many. And this scenario says, hey, if you want to use mines, you get the Germans get three mine markers. So I went ahead and put them down. I will remove them when we start playing. But I put them here. The idea is, uh, I was thinking, well, the allies will probably want to um, assault this if they or, or do a combat on it. If they do a combat, they'd probably get uh, two stacks here and want to attack in. So this would, this minefield would sort of hamper that attack a bit. Or, um, you know, I just put these here as a defensive mechanism. I left a bunch of areas open to keep the allies wondering, where are the mines? You know, um, so I put one on this crossroad here because I figured that that will be problematic once the British crack the you know initial defensive line. Um, I put a very thin defensive line right up here. 
Um, everyone's dug in that can dig in. Um, but I, I put that there to sort of protect this strong point. Um, things will start maneuvering around in a bit, but um, yeah. Also, uh, we're going to have a lot of reinforcements on turn two. There's a whole bunch of artillery. I think it's all artillery in turn three. And then uh, I'm trying to remember, it might be turn four, maybe earlier, I forget. Uh, we start getting able to purchase units to throw into the attack. And that's where I can see some. the Germans will get some tanks. And of course, the British get a lot more stuff. So um, yeah, that's just a quick overview. Well, let's go ahead and get going. Okay, it's turn one. It is uh, June 16th. It's noon. And uh, yeah, it's the British reset phase. It's the beginning of the scenario. There's nothing to reset. Okay, British action phase. Now I should uh, point out that uh, turn one of this scenario is taking place right after a massive artillery barrage by the British against the Germans. Um, they did a, uh, I think like a five hour barrage against them, and then they launched the, sort of a creeping barrage like this, you know, where I imagine the um, it's creeping because the British forces are following the barrage in. And so uh, what the effects of that are is essentially the um, the atmospheric conditions are like light fog. And what that means is that uh, line of sight is only one hex. So we can do combats and assaults, but we can't do um, range attacks in general, in general. Uh, and then all range attacks um, get a minus one die roll. You know, uh, the reason I say in general is that um, Pretty, it's there's some rare circumstances where you can do a um, adjacent ranged attack, but uh, yeah, and then um, since it was it's not just light fog, but there's this massive barrage, uh, the Germans are hampered. They can only move two hexes, and uh, they can't do assaults or combats, but they can do ranged attacks. On this turn, British assaults and combats are also uh, have a one column shift to the right, which is a good shift, I assume, because the uh, the barrage, the effects of the barrage are harming the Germans. Um, the British can't use road movement, perhaps because, um, well, they can't use the road movement, you know, they have to ignore the roads as they're moving, moving through the terrain. Uh, I assume that's because of the smoke and also just sort of following the barrage in maybe. And then, um, not sure why, but they can't go within two hexes of, uh, oh, 0808. Zero seven. Let's see, zero eight zero seven. So they can't go within two x's of here. That's on this first turn. It's all this around here. I don't know why. Maybe, maybe uh, at this time there is another battle going on, or there's another part of the battle, and there's other units. I, I, I'm not really sure though why. Uh, maybe that's just their orders. Uh, incidentally, the map. Um, actually marks the scenario boundaries on it because the designer thought this would be a very popular scenario. So there's light green dots here. So they cruise out here, just down to that restricted spot, cruise across here, um, up through these fields. So it's this quadrant here. Um, yes, so anyway, that means the British have to get in close and they want to take advantage of that right column shift. So they're going to try to get some assaults in probably. Okay, so as the British, what do I want to do? Well, I recognize that this location is a pretty key location. I'd like to uh, sort of crack through this and uh, get back here, get back into this close terrain where I, I can uh, ignore zones of control with my infantry can anyway. Uh, AFVs always ignore zones of control. Okay, so I think uh, this stack here, they're going to move out. Um, I'm going to make a little room for them. So uh, they're going to move one um, movement factor into the field there. And then they're going to um, move into this light bocage. Just as a reminder, light bocage, um, it blocks line of sight, but is not close terrain, which means a zone of controls, zones of control are exerted into light bocage. The infantry uh, costs one to go in there. So they're down to three movement points. The armor, um, I believe, costs two to go in there. Uh, but they got plenty of movement. Okay, and uh, infantry must stop movement when it enters the enemy zone of control. Armor could care less. Uh, but you may always make an assault, um, even if your infantry, uh, provided you have enough movement points remaining. And we're going to do that. 
I considered bringing this guy up over here, and I, I still could at this moment. Um, I could just say, oh, they're going to stop movement. These guys will come over here, and then we'll do a combat during the combat phase. Like, all these units attack here. I think it might be better to assault, but I, I haven't played this game enough to like really have a gut feel for that yet. I'm just going to go with it, though. So, uh, yeah, so infantry moving into woods cost two. Um, so, yeah, they went one, two, that be three, four. They still have one movement point left. Cost, um, let's see... Tracked units, which is the yellow movement factors, um, going into woods cost six. Okay, so uh, yeah, they they can do it too. So we're gonna assault into there. And, uh, yeah, let's let's get a little closer in on here. Ah, but bef before I even have a chance to spend more movement points to make an assault, the Germans get to decide if they want to attack. Uh, line of sight is um, one hex, so that, so they can see these guys. You can always see someone right next to you. And uh, I think this anti-tank gun is going to attack. Um, the anti-tank value is 14, um, with a range of 5, 14. And they are going to either pick these tanks or these tanks. These tanks would be better to take out, but their armor is tougher. So maybe they'll go for the uh, Shermans, which have a Firefly um, amongst them. A Firefly is the, the enhanced Sherman tank. It's much, much better than a regular old Sherman. And uh, if, if you can get a hit on this, it takes out the Firefly. Um, so the, basically the reverse side is the stats for uh, regular old Shermans, including the, the pictures of regular old Sherman too with the shorter barrel. So uh, that might be a better one to try to take out. So we'll go ahead and do that. So um, an anti-tank attack. We're going to take a 14 minus the armor reading. So that gives us uh, a net modifier of plus six. We subtract one for the range of one, so that's plus five. And then uh, light bocage, if uh, you're just in it or moving around in it, is a minus two, so that brings us down to plus three. So it's gonna be a plus three attack. And we're looking to get a 14 by rolling two 10-sided dice. I got a 17, um, plus three is 20. So we did get a hit. Uh, bam. Now, I am playing with op an optional rule from uh, C3I Magazine. Um, number, uh, let's see if I can get it in the camera there, number NR30. Uh, and it has Operation Dauntless, uh, some operation, some optional rules, another scenario, a few things like that. Uh, but one of the optional rules is if you have a multi step unit that does an anti-tank attack and uh, rolls a 20 or more, it can get a free additional anti-tank attack, which I, I kind of like. Um, however, this is not a multi-step unit. It's a single-step unit, so they just got that one hit. All right, now for the assault. So these guys now continue their movement. Um, they could have reacted as part of the armor reaction cycle. They could make a ranged attack. The tanks could um, back against this guy. Um, but uh, they're going to decline and instead pay their movement to go in and assault. Now during an assault, if uh, any side has armored fighting vehicles, well, the British do, then we have to do the tactical advantage uh, procedure before the assault proper. And uh, so we have to calculate some modifiers. First, we compare uh, infantry and machine gun steps. By the way, I'm not going to go into this detail level on every battle, just given a refresher and overview. So yeah, we're going to compare infantry and machine gun steps, attacker minus defender. So these are two-step units. So that's four infantry minus, um, yeah, minus um, one, two, three infantry and machine guns. So that's a plus one. So the British have a plus one in the tactical advantage um, procedure. Then we look at uh, like some other modifiers. I'm kind of, it's on this chart here, but um, if the assault is being conducted from a, from light bocage into close terrain, it is, then there's a minus two. So that means we subtract two and really the, the advantage goes to the Germans. So there, you can think of it as plus one. And that's all there is. So the Germans actually have an advantage here. Um, if I was smart, I would have like thought through this before doing my assault 
and seeing like, oh, the Germans are going to get an advantage. Uh, but uh, because of this, they get to draw two um, tactical advantage chits. Um, how do I know there's two, they get to draw two? Well, it's uh, their um, advantage value plus one. So I'll go ahead and draw two. They get, oh, um, the British lucked out. So uh, the Germans, um, those are their chits. They get to pick one chit. And uh, they will pick the lesser of two evils, which is um, one allied attack, one British attack. Um, this is two British attacks. So we'll go ahead and throw that one away. So yeah, so unfortunately, the British, the Germans had the tactical advantage draw, but the British actually got the jump on them. Of course, since there are no armored fighting vehicles in the German forces, that just sort of washes out. And there, there was no anti-tank fire during the initial phases of the assault. So to conduct the assault proper, first we'll uh, calculate the uh, combat strengths of both sides. So uh, these infantry together, that's eight combat strength, a red um, combat factor means um, it's halved, rounded up when attacking in the close terrain. So that'd be 1.5 rounded up to 2. So that'd be 10. And then um, an orange um, combat factor, that's that's um, a combat shift, I believe. So uh, we're looking at uh, 13. So as a reminder, I'm going to go ahead and um, just set these dice up here to say 13. For the Germans, we're uh, looking at 2, 4, six or two four five <laughs> and then black boxed um combat strengths are doubled on the defense so machine guns are all d doubled so uh what was that that was nine i think yeah so um um yeah there's a nine okay so 13 to nine that is uh three to two i believe let's see half a nine is 4.5 plus nine is uh 13.5. 13.5 is 0.5 more than 13. Um, where I'm going with my silly math is that I missed a 3 to 2 odds column by 0.5, unfortunately. So uh, the Germans just had barely enough to avoid that. So it's going to be a 1 to 1 attack before we do uh, column shifts. So maybe I'll use these dice to tell me column shifts. Um, so I'm just kind of reading through the Assault table. Um, defender in close terrain, they get a column shift to the left. Defender in dug in hex, no. Defender in strong point hex. Um, not cumulative within terrain modifiers. It's two to the left, so I, I can't add two. I have to choose not to use the close terrain, and instead I'm going to get use the strong point modifier. Orange boxed um, combat strength unit. Um, one per every, for every two steps. Got uh, two steps here. Um, so basically that cancels out one of these steps. Um, armor bonus when only one side has AFVs in the combat. And an infantry or machine gun must also be contributing. So um, yeah, we got armor. There's an infantry or machine gun also contributing. There's no armor over here. So um, I think we get a one shift. So we're at a net shift of zero. But on turn one, British assaults get a one column shift to the right. So all that to tell us we're going to roll on um, three to two after all. OK, and we're going to roll a uh, 2d6. Got an 11. Um, 11 on the 1 to 1. Uh, that's, or 3 to 2, I should say. That's good. Zero attacker losses, three defender losses. Now, a strong point can absorb one loss. So we're looking at two losses that we must take in either retreats of all units, um, one, one hex retreat, um, or losses. That's a tough choice. Uh, 
you know, the, the British rolling like this amazing roll is the problem here. Um, I expected this strong point to hold out much longer. Now I could like choose to lose these two units, which are some victory points for the British, and then or, then I would be able to hold them off for at least until the next assault. Or I could retreat these guys. Um, they can retreat um, their retreat, their uh, movement allowance minus two. So each of these guys can retreat uh, two, four, four spaces, and this guy can't retreat at all. So if I did retreat, I'd be losing the anti-tank gun. So that'd satisfy one more loss. And then one more of these, and then I'd have to retreat uh, one hex to satisfy the third loss. I don't think I'm willing to do that yet. I think I might want to just kill the anti-tank gun here. That's one loss. And then we'll kill one of these guys. Okay, and uh, they were in supply when they were killed, so they're going to go into the eligible for reconstitution box. And uh, yeah, so they held off the first British move. Okay, next next uh, British move of the action phase, we're going to start moving these guys. So um, I think they're going to go one, two. Basically, we're going to try to get that hex on this first turn. Um, let's see, tracked, moving into... Heavy bocage will be. Um, I don't have all this stuff memorized yet. Uh, three movement points. We got plenty of movement. So, bam. And uh, yeah, the idea is they're going to attack here. But first, um, there's a minefield there. Now, um, I knew there was a minefield there, but if I put myself in a, a mental state where I don't know what the defensive situation is. I would have done that as myself. So, anyway, let's uh, let's check this out. Okay, we'll go ahead and put the minefield marker out now. Now the effects are that infantry are going to be attacked by the minefield. Um, if I roll a one, um, each infantry unit will take a step loss. Or I guess if either of them rolls a one, they will take a step loss. Well, it didn't happen. And then um, armor on a one or two. I'm lucky that wasn't the armor roll. We'll go ahead and uh, make the um, Firefly the red die. Uh, so uh, we did get a step loss there on the, um, what are these, Centurions or something like that? Might be wrong there. Um, okay, other effects of the minefield. Uh, when you move into a known minefield, you have to spend half your movement points plus the cost to get in there normally. And uh, leaving a minefield, you will take an attack. I believe uh, infantry that does nothing um, while sitting in the minefield can clear it. Um, there's also some uh, other units that can clear mines, but I don't think I have any right now. So that's unfortunate. Now I'm gonna uh, risk it. And I'm gonna go ahead and exit the minefield with my remaining movement points. Because uh, let's see, infantry went one, two, three, four. Ah. They don't have enough movement points to get in there for the assault, so that was kind of dumb of me anyway. Um, yeah, okay, well, they, they'll chill out there. Uh, you know, the armor units can assault. The armor units can assault. They have enough. Um, I think it was uh, one, two, three, four, five, and then I think this costs six. There'd be 11. Yeah, they, they can get in and do an assault there. Um, that might be super risky, but it'd be nice to like knock that strong point out right now. Um, but they have a 33% chance of taking a step loss. Oh, dude. Uh, yeah, they're they're just gonna they're gonna pause. Sure, would be nice to do that. Uh, yeah, they'll pause, and then you know maybe they'll do a combat during the combat phase. Now at this point, as the British, I think I would guess that the minefields, because I know there's two more counters, are here and here, because it's sort of German unit, empty, empty, empty German unit. Uh, in reality, there's one here and not here. The third one's here. Um, but anyway, so I guess I would have to decide, like my follow-up units, are they gonna risk the minefields? Um, 
Now, I, I, got it. I do have to be careful of German counterattacks. It's probably not likely, but if I send everyone in here, I wouldn't want the Germans to kind of get around here and maybe try to pick off some easy picking stragglers or something. So, uh, yeah, I got to think of a, what am I going to do now? By the way, I should have mentioned, I'm, I'm sort of like not articulating every little decision I'm making, but um, this uh, half track here it has an anti tank capability, so it has some kind of cannon mounted on it of four. So it could have tried to make an attack there, but that would trigger the armored reaction cycle. Um, and I, it's really thin skinned, so its armor is only two. Um, so I didn't want to risk triggering it. Um, of course, these guys are adjacent to each other, so they do see each other, um, which maybe means. I should fire right now, but uh, yeah, we'll just we'll just hold off. But yeah, so yeah, let's see what the British are gonna do with these other units over here. So uh, yeah, thought about this a bit. I think I think if I didn't know where anything was, I would still probably want to bring this stack here up in to here. Either come into here, but more likely try to take this location out. Um, I don't want to go in here because then I could be like surrounded, right? So maybe try to take this location out. Um, yeah, and you know, I'd be right next to um, Christo. So yeah, let's go ahead and do that. So um, we're going to spend uh, two movement points, I believe. I will go check that to load this machine gun onto its, um, it's like a, Bren carrier type, oh, universal carrier. That's what the U is there. So we're gonna, um, the U is there next to its movement allowance. So it's gonna load onto the universal carrier. Yes, that did that did cost two to load. Okay. Um, so let's see, I think we're gonna go, um, they're all tracked. So one, two, three into here. Uh, this guy spent two already, so he's the slowest. Well, he's tied for slowest at 14, so we'll go down one, two, three to go nine, eight, seven, six, five. Yeah. Now, these are AFVs now, including the machine gun, now that it's inside its um, universal carrier. Uh, so they cannot uh, be attacked with like ranged attacks. Uh, they, they can't be harmed, uh, but they can be attacked with anti-tank attacks. So the question is, is this guy here going to do an anti-tank attack? There's still some movement points left. In fact, I need to remind myself how many I spent again. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Um, so I'm going to mark on, um, there's a chart for tracking various things. I'm going to mark, I have seven movement points remaining. Um, so yeah, are the Germans going to attack? Remember this hill up here, um, even it might be able to see this hex, except we have all this smoke on the battlefield from the creeping barrage. So yeah, what are they going to do? And are these guys going to attack here? Or are they going to sit there? Or are they going to come in here? But first the Germans have to make a decision. Well, they don't want to trigger the arc, so they're not going to fire. But in addition to that, I almost forgot, there's another minefield there. So we have four AFVs. Um, I only have three dice, so we'll go ahead and, well, actually I have to do this um, two at a time, I guess. So we'll do uh, the Sherman is the red die. Um, we're looking at a one or a two to hit. Uh, no hits, and then we'll go ahead and do the machine gun is the red die for the uh, two carriers. Oh man, that's that's brutal. Um, okay, so minefields are rough. Okay, um, yeah, so let's see, these guys each have an asterisk next to their armor. Actually, the asterisk is not what is relevant, it's the circle around their armor that indicates that. Um, the transports for these units are part of a larger transport pool. And so if they take losses, that transport pool is reduced. So the idea is like, if they take losses, um, some of the units are knocked out. 
um, but the pool might refill them. So we have to track um, losses to this pool. So anyway, um, transport losses. So uh, this guy, you know, it's only a one-step unit. So uh, it immediately has to um, unload. And then we'll roll to see if the transport unit uh, survives. So there's a survival table. Um, where is it? Here. Okay, so it's going to roll 1d6. Got a 5. No effect. Okay, so um, the transported unit was not destroyed. Since their transports were destroyed, but the, the units were not, um, we have to reduce the British transport pool, which is a size of 2 right now, down to 1. And the Germans get 1 victory point for that. So the Germans have a victory point. Woo! Now for this uh, sort of scout platoon here, carrier platoon, I should say. Um, yeah, let's roll 1d6. Got a six, no effect. Okay, cool. Um, but they did lose um, their transports. So uh, that's another point from the transport pool and one more victory point. The British transport pool is at zero. So it's been uh, depleted. So more losses will be double victory points for the Germans. Okay, and now I need to decide, are they gonna assault into the neighboring hex? I think the answer is no, I don't wanna take more minefield losses. Um, I'm not sure, I have to read the rules. I don't think these guys count as infantry for clearing mines. So this, this minefield is gonna be problematic and probably a little bit deadly, but I think um, they will stop their movement and instead rely on the combat phase to get some attacks out. Okay, for the rest of the British, um, I think this hill is going to stay where it is. I think this mortar will stay here too. It has a range of six. Yeah. And then uh, I think these tanks, they're just going to like sort of move forward a bit. They'll, I think they're just going to go up to this farm here. And uh, there'll be sort of a deterrent to a German counterattack. I'm reluctant to move them up into here. And um, there might be more minefields there. There's one more minefield undiscovered. Um, yeah, we'll just see what happens during the combat phase for these guys here. Okay, we're leaving the action phase, going to the British combat phase. Okay, so the uh, first combat I'm going to do um, is these two hexes are going to combat against this strong point. I considered having them each go against a different hex here, but um, I really want to take this strong point out. So uh, we'll go ahead and do that. I need to also declare uh, the combat support I'm going to contribute. There's really not much available right now. The only thing the allies have is this mortar here. This is the offensive combat support. So this mortar will uh, participate. So maybe I'll go like this to remind myself. Um, and then um, the defenders have to allocate defensive support. And I think they will. Uh, there's two um, mortar units on the board. Uh, I think we'll go ahead and have this one here. It's range is six, one, two, three, four. Yeah, so this guy can spot them. So uh, yeah, we'll go ahead and allocate those guys. Okay, we'll go ahead and resolve the uh, allied uh, mortar, uh, which is providing support for this combat. Um, yeah, so we're gonna roll uh, 2d6 on the rat, the ranged attack table. And uh, let's check out our modifiers. So. Um, plus one for each company level, uh, company sized infantry unit in the target hex. Well, there, there's a machine gun and a platoon, so nothing there. It's um, close terrain, but it's also a strong point. So um, I believe we have to take the, um, the better of those two, or our choice, I suppose. Um, so, uh, yeah, so let me just remind myself here with a die. So we have plus one and then minus two. So we'll, we'll do red as minus one. Okay, um, target is not concealed, they're not retreated, they're not all AFVs, there's no tactical recon marker. Uh, it's not direct fire, it's indirect via a mortar. The spotter for the indirect fire is non-adjacent. Well, um, I, you can declare your spotter at any time. I'm just gonna declare this guy. So uh, he is adjacent, so there's no modifier there. Um, and then I think everything else, oh, here's one last modifier that effects, which is um, minus two for light fog. We don't really have light fog, but it's smoke that behaves like light fog. So we're looking at a minus three, I believe. Actually, just reading the notes um, at the bottom of this chart, it says um, 
note number one it says dug in and strong point um, that are in addition to the terrain. So the terrain is close terrain, so we have to add the terrain to that too. So that's a minus four. That's pretty good. Okay. Um, yeah, let's roll two dice. Uh, I should say that's pretty good for the defender. Uh, two dice. I rolled a five. Minus four is a one. No effect. I need to roll at least a 14 to do something. So that was lame for the British. I'm going to go ahead and move the red arrow on the mortar up to show that it's used its one action for the turn. Now for the German mortar, there's two uh, hexes attacking, so it has to pick one. Uh, I think we'll pick the one that's not in close terrain. So this one, it's also not in a minefield. Make sure I have in range. Yes, it's in range. Uh, oh, you know, my last attack, I forgot to add the uh, attack strength of the mortar, which was a five to the roll. It still was too low. Um, so anyway, uh, this guy, his, um, he's attacking two companies of infantry, so that's plus two. And then, uh, oh, I guess this light bocage has no effect on um, the result, or the die roll modifier. Um, just leading to, oh, and then light fog. Light fog, or in other words, smoke is the only other thing. That's a minus two. Yeah, that fog really affects it. So plus two, minus two, that's zero. So a net of uh, zero. Let's roll. We've got an 11. 11 plus three is 14. That's just enough to suppress. So these guys here, they are suppressed. And then uh, this mortar is used up. Now uh, for the defender, it's always good to use up all your um, your uh, weapons that have this red arrow on them because they'll reset when it's your turn next. So, uh, so yeah, you kind of want to maximize that. Okay, now for the combat itself, we're going to total the uh, attack strengths, the attacker. So we got uh, eight and eight for infantry, so that's 16. Red combat strength units um, are halved and then rounded up, so uh, we're looking at four for there, so that's a total of uh, 20. And then uh, 25 for these two tanks with the orange attack strength. So we're looking at 25 to six, uh, because black combat strengths are doubled on the defense. So 25 to six, that is uh, four to one odds. Uh, four to one is reduced by one for the uh, suppression of the British troops, even though it's just one hex, uh, it still counts for the overall combat. Uh, the defender is in a strong point. That's another two. So we're now at three to two. Uh, we have an orange boxed um, unit. So um, actually we get one shift per um, two steps of orange box units. We have three steps, but it says rounded up. So that's two shifts to the right. The max you can do those is three shifts. Uh, we get an armor bonus um, for the British because they are the only side with AFVs and there are also some infantry. Um, so shift it one more to the right. And then um, finally, uh, because of the bombardment, we get one more shift. So wow, five to one. Nice. So we're going to roll 2d6. Rolled a 10. A 10 on the five to one. Wow, that's, a, that's five defender losses. Now we clearly can't hold this hex by taking losses, but the strong point will take one. So that's four losses. The machine gun will take one, so that's three losses. And then uh, this guy, he's only a single step unit. His retreat distance is uh, six minus two, so that would be uh, four. Um, so he definitely can survive by absorbing the last three losses via retreating. Um, he can retreat through here, um, even though there's enemy here, because zones of control are not projected into close terrain, the dark green. So one, two, three. I guess we'll come back here. Um, to this join this mortar over here and then it has to be marked as retreated it's probably not going to really matter but uh if on the outside chance it gets attacked which it won't um i just want to know that it had retreated um so yeah that was that was overkill it was also a good die roll if this hex was a field uh not only would it have to retreat through an enemy zone of control and that would be destroyed uh, but it could also uh undergo friction fire um but uh yeah it's not since the hex has been vacated, uh, any and all attackers may advance, and uh, we will. We won't advance out of the minefield because they would have to undergo a minefield attack, but all these guys will advance forward. Now, um, it is possible to do a multi-hex advance because the uh, defender retreated more than one hex, 
but as soon as um well yeah there's really no place to multi-hex advance too so we'll just go right there and yes the uh, uh strong points that are not printed on the map are eliminated the next combat uh these guys are going to come back over here and uh yeah they are in a minefield um so their combat strength it's going into close terrain uh so this is a uh, 2.5 rounded up to three four five six seven eight nine 14. Uh, that's probably not going to be a very good attack. But uh, we'll, yeah, we'll, we'll try this out. So 14 to 6. That's a uh, 2 to 1. Um, oh, but before I do that, uh, we have to allocate um, support. I don't have any support from the British to allocate, but the Germans do have some port potential up here, this uh, mortar. So they might as well activate that mortar. Uh, they declare it. Now, once everything's done declaring, we can go ahead and apply the support. Looking at the, all the various modifiers, it looks like the only modifier is a minus two for the smoke. Roll to seven, seven plus the attack strength of four is 11, minus two is nine. We have to roll a 14 to get uh, suppressed, so nothing there. Okay, so the combat proper, we have a, a two to one. Uh, so combat shifts, uh, three to one for the orange, um, attack factor there, uh, back to two to one for being dug in, down to three to two for close terrain, uh, up to two to one for having, um, for the, uh, artillery bombardment this turn. So we're, I think we're at two to one. I'm going to do one last little check. Yeah, it's straight two to one. We don't get the armor bonus, even though we have armor in an infantry or machine gun, because the enemy has armor. So you only get the armor bonus if you're the only one with armor and you have um, some infantry helping it out. Roll on two dice. Roll a nine. Nine on the two to one column. Ooh, that's three losses. Man, uh, British are killing it here. The Germans only have three steps here, so that could eliminate all three. Um, but instead, I think we're going to hold on to our forces a little. Uh, so we will, um, I think we're going to retreat a total of three. So maybe this guy will go one, two, three up with the mortar here. Um, and this guy, they don't have to go together. He'll go one, two, three up to, w up to uh, join this armored car up on the a hill, hill in this direction anyway. Okay. The uh, dug-in marker is removed as soon as there's no enemies there. Now to decide, do these guys want to advance? And I think I do. Even though I'm in the minefield, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna take the risk. It's gonna be pretty bloody. But we're gonna. All these guys are advancing. I like this close terrain here. The minefield can stay. Now we gotta roll. First, the two tanks. So we'll do the green as the top tank. One or two, they take a step loss. Oh man, uh, horrible, horrible. This is some good minefields of the. Um, German, so that guy took a step loss and this guy takes a step loss. Ouch. Okay, and then uh, we'll do green on the top for this guy. These are only ones because they. Actually, no, the bottom is a one or two because it's armored. Um, look at that, another step loss. Brutal. Ah, lost, lost our machine gun. Um, that's, that's not good. Maybe that was really dumb, but uh, I want to get forward here. Now, this advance could trigger is a trigger for the arc. Uh, these guys can see these guys. Um, so this guy could do a four strength anti-tank attack against this eight armor tank, but I think it would just be asking to be destroyed. So it'll just hold on there for the moment. That's all the combat that can be done. So that's the end of the British portion of turn one. Now for the German reset phase, we'll get a, rid of those retreated markers. The German mortars will uh, reset to being eligible to fire. Now for the German action phase, remember they can only move um, one or two uh, hexes, if I recall. I think the main goal is to block uh, the potential for units advancing um, through, through the gaps. Now there's still one undiscovered minefield, so I suppose if I fill the gaps, it'll be obvious where the minefield is, but um, I'm gonna try to, I have to try to figure out some way to prevent on turn two once the smoke lifts. These guys, you know, running amok behind my lines before I even get uh, reinforcements. Okay, so let's let's try to <laughs> let's try to <laughs> figure this out. So I think uh, since the British are going in heavy on the south, we want to we don't need all these guys up here. So um, I think these guys 
we're going to go one, two, back to here. I'm going to rotate it so I know it moved. Um, this dug in marker is gone. Um, then I think this guy, well, we'll have this guy go next. He's going to go one, two, and join this engineer down here. Hope you can see this okay. And then um, I think this guy way up here is going to go one, two, and go into the strong point. Um, so I move the guy out of the strong point first to make room for that guy to come in. That dug-in marker's gone. Um, I think this guy, is he still useful? Yeah, he's useful. He's useful. He'll just sort of hold this flank a little bit. Um, yeah, I guess we'll keep this guy up here for now. Uh, this engineer, yeah, I want the engineer to move out. It's going to go here, and the idea is next turn it will uh, dig in. Um, okay. This field, I'm okay with enemy units entering. Um, in fact, I think that'd be good if they did. Um, so, But I need to get a little more defensive stuff down there. So maybe, uh, maybe we'll just have this guy come down here. And, you know, this armored car up here, I was thinking it was a hill originally, but it's only a hill going in this direction, not in this direction. So uh, I might want to bring him down as well. Uh, maybe it'll come down and join this mortar. Um, let's see, so just as a reminder, it's wheeled. And a wheeled unit moving through light bocage it costs four, but it's got a movement of 20, so eight. Remember, I'm only moving these guys two hexes max because of the, uh, the bombardment has made it so they're stunned or whatever. Okay, down here though, this this hex is probably going to fall, right? Um, so maybe, maybe I'll just pull this guy back. I'm just going to buy a little time. This this lone platoon here is going to try to hold off this onslaught. Um, yeah, that's about all I can do, I think. Uh, yeah. Okay, that was the German action phase. Actually, before I move to the next phase, um, I think I want to use my uh, mortars. So I have two mortars. Um, yeah, they'll be doing a range attack. And uh, yeah, this mortar, we'll use this guy as a spotter. We're going to attack um, the woods here, probably. They're both close terrain. So I am using the plunging fire uh, optional rule. So that means I do a plunging fire attack from this guy against each of these armored units, for starters. And then we do a ranged attack against the infantry. So a uh, plunging fire against this first guy. We do one unit at a time. And then, uh, well, maybe we'll target this guy first. Uh, one unit at a time until there's a step loss inflicted or we run, or we run out of units. So uh, roll two dice ten for plunging fire. And... Uh, I got a 9. You add your ranged attack strength, which is 3, so that's 12. We need to roll a 20. Um, and then there's some modifiers. So uh, it's for every 3 increments of armor that the unit has, you subtract 3. So like this guy, uh, let's see, f dropping fractions. Okay, so that'd be a minus 2. I mean, I definitely didn't hit. And then uh, minus 2 also for there being fog. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, actually, it's impossible. It's impossible. There's too many minuses because of the fog, because of the armor. Um, so I don't even need to roll for this guy over here. But uh, we'll go ahead and roll for these guys on the uh, ranged attack table. We're looking for a 14 or less, or more, I should say. We got an 8 plus 3 for its um, ranged attack strength. That is 11. And then uh, looking at all the modifiers, there's not enough pluses, if any, to do anything. So uh, yeah, so this guy is done. Um, one thing I'm not 100% sure of is does this trigger the arc? I think it probably does, but we'll see. Uh, it doesn't because it's not within line of sight because uh, of the smoke. So uh, cool. So now the uh, other uh, mortar up here is going to fire. Um, I suppose it'll go here, and that's going to be three plunging fire attacks. Let's go ahead and do the first one. Um, if I'm not even rolling close to 20, so I rolled a 5, it's like not even worth 
adding things up. But this guy fires at a four. So uh, if I roll uh, you know, more than 16, I'll, I'll look at the modifiers. So that's a 15 plus four is 19. Yeah, there's no positive modifiers to plunging fire. Um, 13, uh, nope. Okay, so this is a very low chance of killing anything. I should have pointed at each guy that I'm attacking, but uh, so yeah, that guy finished with his plunging fire attacks. And that is the end of the uh, German action phase. German combat phase, well, we're not gonna do anything. We don't, we don't wanna uh, participate in combat. We're not really equipped for it right now. We just need to try to hold out until we can get some reinforcements. And uh, now for the victory phase, no one has achieved their victory objectives. So that's the end of turn one, and you'll have to keep an eye out for turn two. Thanks for watching and catch you later.